All right, welcome everyone to our advocacy webinar today. We are glad that you are here and um, excited to be able to present this webinar to you. I will go ahead and pass it off to Esther. Hello, everybody. We are um, gonna start off with some announcements from Voices for Prevention. Um, and we're really gonna kind of do a more casual uh, conversation type of webinar today. Um, we're gonna go over some of the things that um, we want to do to prepare for our big prevention days this year. Um, but we're also going to go over some of the things that we can do um, around the year, not just during this time of year, but around the year for advocacy. So let me start. The... Pass this back to Nicole. All right, we have several announcements to make. Um, first of all, the slides today will be available in PDF format in the chat box. So you can feel free to um, download those and keep track of that um, if you wish. Um, our big announcement is that our Substance Abuse Prevention Day is coming up February the 24th and that will be held virtually and uh, in person. So we're doing a hybrid event. And um, so you can register on our website uh, today. Um, it, we are also having our Suicide Prevention Day, March the 30th. That will also be a hybrid event in, for, in person and virtual as well. Um, in leading up to our Substance Abuse Prevention Day, we are going to do our pre-event webinar. And that will be February the 18th at 11 a.m. This will give you everything you need to know about the virtual platform, about um, the in-person event on the 24th. It will give you um, parking information, how to access the virtual platform, all of that great stuff. Um, so we are excited about our two prevention days. And if you have any, excuse me, if you have any questions regarding those, prevention days, feel free to check out the links in the chat box. Um, we also want to encourage everyone here to become a V4P member. Um, the membership is completely free and we have lots of things that we offer our membership, um, such as networking events, um, health trainer calls, um, the suicide prevention clinician networking um, lots of great webinars, advocacy webinars, such as today. Um, so we offer great things and we'd love to have you as a member. You can also check out our website for um, the membership link, and that should be in the chat box as well. All right, I'll pass it back over to Esther. Thank you, Nicole. We are gonna go over some basics. Now, I know that some of the names that I see on here have been around for a little bit, and um, some of the basics are uh, things that you've probably heard every year. Um, but I think it's important for all of us to be on the same page when it comes to some of the Advocacy 101 basics in order for us then to build on that. And I wanna uh, just go over a few things so that we can all get on the same page. This is a definition for advocacy. Um, it's defined as any action that speaks in favor of, recommends, argues for a cause, supports or defends, or pleads on behalf of others. So that's a lot of different types of, of, of words, right? But the main word I want us to focus on is action. So advocacy is action. It's something that we do. And there are different levels of what we can do. Um, as I mentioned there, re recommending, arguing, supporting, defending, pleading, um, but remember that advocacy is an action. Most people have heard that there are two kinds of advocacy, um, policy education and lobbying. And we're gonna just uh, really focus on policy education, but I want everyone to at least have the definition or, or know what lobbying is to understand the difference between the two. The main thing about lobbying is that you are requesting an elected official to vote a certain way on a certain bill or ordinance. 
That is the gist of it. So lobbying means you know that line between policy education and lobbying is if there is a certain bill or an ordinance and we are requesting or uh, arguing with uh, an elected official to vote a certain way on that bill or ordinance, that becomes lobbying. Now, I will mention for those of you that, that have been around for a little bit, there is some, some portion of our budgets that can be used for that. And as individuals, we can do that. We're not gonna get into that today, okay? We will be providing more advanced advocacy training later on. Um, but most of us know that if you receive state funding, if you receive federal funding, we are not allowed to lobby with those funds, okay? So we are not allowed to ask a elected official to vote a certain way on a certain bill with our state and federal funding. So that is lobbying. We are gonna focus on policy education. And I think that, that we all understand what, what this part is, but I want to expand a little bit um, that it involves different various kinds of, of education of policymakers and the public about the problem um, that we are concerned about and the changes that we want to see in our communities or in our state. There are different kinds of education um, that, that we want to mention here. I think it's really important to talk about, um, I just skipped one. Uh, the important thing is that we have to educate ourselves. So that's one type of education. We wanna make sure that we are educated. Um, the second thing is we wanna make sure that we educate our community partners, those that are working with us, whether it's uh, school personnel, law enforcement, other social service uh, or youth care providers. We wanna make sure that our community is informed or educated on what, what is going on. Our local officials is another level of policy education um, that we wanna do. It's not just about going to the Capitol, it's also about sharing this information, educating our commissioners, our city council people, our the, the, the mayors and other um, community stakeholders about these issues. And of course, it's about educating then our elected officials. Those are some of the steps, the action steps that it takes to do some of the basic advocacy um, components. Now, who do we advocate to? I'm gonna pass this on to Megan to tell us how we know who are my legislators. Thanks, Esther. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Can everyone see this? Yes. Wonderful. Okay. Um, so this is the website that y'all are going to go to, um, to figure out who your legislators are. I'm going to walk you through step by step. Uh, and even if you know who your legislators are, there are a few things that you can learn from visiting this site that I would recommend before uh, you start the uh, advocacy process. Um, so open states, you can search by state. Um, on the right-hand side, there's gonna be a blank bar where you can enter your address. You wanna enter your full address. And then when you click search, this is what's gonna come up. Um, this is a house that's, I picked a random house that's for sale on Zillow. If any, anyone's looking, it's a beautiful home on a golf course. This is not where I live. But um, these are the representatives, both state and federal uh, for this particular home. So, um, the cool thing is once you figure out who the folks are that represent you, you can learn a little bit more about them. And that's gonna be something that's really gonna help you. Um, so not only when you click on their name, will you figure out their contact information? You can also learn things like what bills have they sponsored? Um, this might be brought up later, but you know, finding a champion is really important. So if you know somebody's already done something kind of in your favor or, um, maybe not in your favor, that's a good thing to know before you get started. Uh, you'll also be able to see recent votes um, that the uh, representative participated on and, and how they voted. Um, so that, that's kind of a quick walkthrough, but 
it's a really simple uh, process and a fantastic website. Does anybody have any questions or suggestions related to this? No? Okay, Esther? All right, thank you very much. And I really appreciate you sharing that about um, to know what bills they've supported or have been a part of, what committees have they been a part of. That's really important. Going back to that education part, it's about educating ourselves, right? Because we can't go and educate others unless we're educated. And um, a little bit later, I'm gonna talk a little about knowing who you targeted or who, who your audience is. And if you know what where this person stands on these issues, it's gonna help you, it's gonna help you prepare to better educate them. So that is a very important aspect of uh, education is going on that website, finding more about your elected officials. Here we go. Back to this. And speaking of elected officials, we have an advantage. Oh, where do I start from the slide? Technology. There we go. Um, we have someone that is a representative who is in the prevention field. And he has been wonderful throughout the years to work with and couldn't be here today, but did offer us some information that Shannon is gonna be able to share. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Shannon Lawson from Epson GenRx. Just uh, when we were planning for this webinar and this training, we wanted to kind of hear from an elected official themselves of how um, best to reach them, especially during the session time, but even after uh, pre or post uh, the legislative session and what better uh, avenue, as Esther said, or contact that we have in the prevention field, but our fellow preventionist, Stephen Sains out of Camden County. He is a house of representative, um, a house representative actually representing, I think the 180th district, um, his area down in St. Mary's. And so I, I emailed him last week and he's covered up with uh, meetings today or he would have been with us, but he sent some uh, points um, how best he feels people can reach out uh, to their elected officials. So the first one is he just encouraged us all, if you haven't already, to create a personalized one pager. Uh, something that can be shared either electronically or paper form um, with your official uh, to their official member email account. So if you use the process that Megan talked about earlier of finding your official, you'll find their official um, uh, uh, contact information and use that email account. And then on that page, along with legislation that they're covering or, or um, committees that they're on, they also should list a legislator and an assigned assistant. He suggested you CC that assistant as well and their email will be listed there as well. And that information, like I said, is found on the legislator's official um, webpage. In, in the email, if the leg, you can ask the legislator if they have a preferred email or phone number um, to use for any future com communication. And then next, he suggested um, that you can request in that email a 10 to 15 minute, either in person, virtual, or maybe even a phone call briefer with your legislator. Now we know that we have some um, uh, special times that we're experiencing where um, maybe in-person is not um, the way to go at the moment, or maybe your person is good with in-person. Maybe he, has, he or she has a, a procedure set up to be able to meet in person, but you can request that in-person virtual or phone call briefer with your legislator. And then in that meeting, highlight what your coalition is doing for their given district, and also he said to relate the coalition funding to the work. So especially, I guess, um, if it's a state elected official, you wanna um, talk about, you know, the work that we do is oftentimes funded by either through DVHD funding or um, just so that connects the work that you're doing um, to the funding stream that they may be asked to appropriate funding for or remember again, or, or, or just helps them connect every all the dots. 
Again, uh, look, thinking back to Esther's uh, conversation earlier, we're not lobbying when we do that. We're not talking about specific legislation and connection to that funding. We are just, uh, gen just in general talking about the work that we do in their, commu in their community that they represent, the positive effects that that represents, and then the funding that helps make that work possible. And then if there's no reply to that email, he highly suggested that we follow up with a phone call um, using the office line that's listed on their webpage, if nothing else. He said that um, oftentimes, especially when the House is in session, um, that legislators get receive a lot of robot emails from the various many parties that have a vested interest in legislation that the legislator will be asked to vote on. Um, and that, my friends, is called lobbying. Um, so they receive phone calls, not from us, or robo calls, not from us, but from that, and robo, robo email, excuse me, that may bury our emails down a bit. And so if we wanted to follow up, if no action has been, no reply has been received for, uh, from the legislator to us, from our initial email or communication, um, you can follow up with a call and just, uh, let that person be aware that you did email them and maybe make a meeting that 10 to 15 minute in-person virtual or phone call briefly. Now, there are probably other ways that you guys on the call have either met with or spoken to either prior or post or during session. If you have any suggestions to those in the call, you wanna unmute yourself or maybe type it in the chat, type it in the chat. Um, we'd love to hear your suggestions on that. Again, that was just Stephen's suggestions on how he receives the best way he can receive information from his constituents. Um, and so we, we, we were grateful to have that to uh, give us suggestions here. But of course, there are always other suggestions. We're gladly open to that. I gotta work, work on my lighting, this is terrible, it's so bright question just to kind of put it out there for discussion when we're talking about um, communicating with our legislator um, I think one of the things that I, I used to feel when I started off and, and sometimes I think even throughout the years there's a sense of what if I don't have all the answers right. what if you know I set up this 15 minute call or, or virtual thing and I have my little notes ready of what I want to talk about. What if they ask me something or something comes up that I don't know about? How should I handle something like that? So here's the great thing about this world we live in. Not everybody knows everything. And even the elected official is asked to remember so much of all kinds of different areas. So I even think they would maybe say they don't know everything. And so when we're asked and we don't know something or maybe we need further explanation or maybe we need to get some deeper knowledge base information for them, I think it's perfectly fine to say, you know what, I don't know the exact answer you're asking for, but I'll be glad to look and see, find the answer for you and get back to you with that information. Also what that does, when you follow through and do exactly what you say and re retrieve that information and bring it to him or her, that starts to build a rapport with them. And what ultimately I think we should see ourselves as an, a an advocate, we're advocating for our cause, but also a line of communication. So when this person, elected official does or is brought a piece of legislation or a question or concern, they know that we are working in the field in prevention, substance abuse, suicide, mental health, and we can be their connection and may not know the answer, but we're going to get them the answer. And I think that's super key. That was a great answer, Shannon. Does anybody else have any other questions or suggestions? I have a question and I don't know, I don't know if he spoke to this and I feel like this is something I should know, but I don't. Okay. Um, what what do you think about repetition? If it's hard to get a hold of someone, and you don't want to spam them, right? right. right. Um, but you know, is one email and one phone call sufficient? How hard should you work to make contact with someone? Well, I think um, you know, I think you need to use your best judgment. Um, you don't want 
to robo spam them, like you said, because they get enough of that. And then that's going to turn them away. That doesn't, that doesn't lend itself to be um, relational. Is that a word? Relational. No, that's not a word. That doesn't uh, lend itself to be a relationship that lends itself to be a nuisance. So there is a fine line, and I appreciate you mentioning that. I think it, I think maybe um, that uh, if you don't hear anything back from the person, building that relationship uh, maybe with the legislative assistant, um, getting them on the phone is a lot easier sometimes than getting the legislator themselves on the phone, or even in the, even in the home district office, there may be someone there that could take your call. Um, and then also, it's not stalking, but also following them on social media and kind of noting when they're going to be in the community and you showing up at the chamber event or you showing up at the school board event where they're going to be and trying to um, just make those connections of who you are and the work you're doing. And I just, I, it's a little extra work on us for sure, but um, I think that will pay off dividends when we're in need of getting their ear or yeah, their ear. Thank you. I agree with that, Shannon, very much. I also had the thought of um, the different types of communication. Mm -hmm. So it's not that nuisance that you're talking about. So sure. if, if I call and leave a message and there's no response, then maybe I email uh, a few facts. Here, here are right. five quick facts mm -hmm. about this. Um, and then if, if I don't hear back from that, then I could, you know, do something else. So different types of communication um, so that they become familiar with who we are and what we're trying to do that, um, but that it doesn't cross that line into becoming right. a, a nuisance. When I, I think we're all professional, we know how we would want to receive information and, and, and build rapport with someone. And I think we just um, turn around and, 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 and send it in the same fashion. Um, something you said, Esther, uh, uh, sparked something in my mind. If we're sending out um, uh, monthly, quarterly information from our coalition, maybe it's a newsletter, maybe it's a social media, um, information or some types of infographics, including um, their office email in that. Um, I know that's a type of, uh, of uh, possibly a large robust email, but I, th I think just uh, making that connection and sending out any information that we're doing and, and publicizing it to them as well is another great way. And that maybe works more better, more better, works better, excuse me, um, when session, when it's not in session. So there's not as heightened, um, an influx of communication to the legislator. I think it's key for us to use our off-season time. I know we're in, se in session now, but it's key for us to use off-season time at our advantage um, to get their ear and build that rapport and relationship. Absolutely. Because advocacy, again, is year-round. It it's, is. It's not it sure about is. just this time. Sure. Um, I, I think it's also, it, it, to add to that, Shannon, and please, if anyone else, please unmute yourself or write something in the chat is that they wanna know what's going on in the community. And so by sending them those newsletters, by letting them know of the activities, if, if you're having a town hall, if you're having one of those, uh, maybe a lunch and learn type of a event or a parent night, um, letting them know these things are going on gives them an opportunity to either go, maybe send someone, or at least uh, know what's going on in the community that they're um, representing. So definitely keeping them involved and informed is, is, is crucial. Are there any comments or questions in the chat? Um, hi, this is Tequoya. Hi, Tequoya. Um, but yes, I wanted to also just remind people that um, when it comes to political officials who are elected officials, um, we are votes. Um, if you are a coalition leader, um, you represent a group of voters. So, um, I mean, essentially, if, if you're not hearing something from someone, I wouldn't even assume that it's on purpose because they are pulled in a lot of different directions. But that's definitely an advantage um, of using your influence and um, 
you you definitely be around those people in different situations probably even by accident um but just taking that opportunity to, to touch base with them and following up when i had i think i had my first uh, meeting with one with an official um and we talked and it was something that came up during our meeting but i forgot um uh, well not forgot but i didn't have whatever it was on hand but i could like email it to him and so right after our meeting i followed up like in the next 30 minutes with the information that they um, wanted to know so um if given the opportunity definitely following up is important Excellent. Thank you, Takoya, for sharing that. And I think one of the things that I've heard at, in other webinars and other people share is that you want to become the go-to person, right? So if you are the expert in this, with this issue in your community, if you are the substance abuse prevention or the suicide prevention uh, person, or you're part of that organization or coalition, you want them to know that they can come to you, that if you don't know the answer, you will find the answer for them, that you will get them, to give them the information that, that, that they need. But that's part of building that relationship that they, they get to the point that they know to go to you if there's something about that issue going on in the community or something that they need regarding that specific issue. Any other questions or suggestions? Actually, I thought of another question. So Shannon or anybody else that wants to answer this, um, what if I live in a different community than I work? And well, how do I handle that in terms of which elected official do I visit? Well, so uh, that's my case. I live in a community and, um, but my representatives for the community that I work in are, are different. So um, you have, to, obviously um, for advocacy work for the coalition or collaborative work that you're doing, the prevention work you're doing, you want to, um, doesn't hurt to, to, uh, to speak to your own elected officials in your own community, but definitely you want to speak to the uh, elected officials that cover your community, your coalition work area. Um, so um, I, we, as a coalition in Upson County, just started building a rapport with our two um, our to our House of Representative and our state senator and um, just letting them know every time we see them they're very much incorporated in the community and in the chamber events and we became a member of the chamber and um, have kind of um, been in those circles a little bit to be around them and let them know what we're doing and what we're about. Um, and I, always I, I say I represent the community of Upson, which I do. Um, uh, and and they and they know that I, I don't live there, but that but, but my work is there. Um, so I'm very upfront about it. It's not something I'm trying to hide or or maybe uh, pull the wool over on anyone's eyes. But then also uh, in Troop County, where I where I live, um, they also know my passion for prevention, um, uh, and uh, they also know that they can. I also let them know that I'm available, along with my fellow prevention partners that uh, work for different agencies that do work here in Troop County. Uh, just try to uh, coordinate those efforts and make sure if there is a need there in either space that they can reach out to me either pro professionally or personally. Um, and personally, if I reached out personally, you know, we can do the other thing. But professionally, we'll be advocating all day long, twice on Sunday. Excellent, Shannon. Yes, thank you for that. I know that that's been something that has been brought up in the past. And um, sometimes you feel like, well, I can't speak to the elected officials in the community that I work in because I don't live there and right. I don't vote in that. But it's like you said, that's where you're working. That's where the issue that you're addressing is. So that's definitely where you wanna do, where you wanna advocate, but doesn't mean that you can't advocate obviously uh, to the representatives of where you live as Absolutely. well. Any other questions or suggestions? I think this has been a really great discussion so far. All right, we're going on to the next section. So now we know how to find out who our legislators are. We know we have some suggestions, right? 
from um, and, and how to communicate and 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 how to get uh, those appointments and, and those connections and build those relationships. So v for p wanted to offer some tools, letting you know that we have some tools available um, for you to use at any way that, that you may need to. Um, the first one is a toolkit that we developed a couple of years ago, um, and it is available to uh, show on, online to, to download. And actually I am going to, I had it open so that people can see what it looks like. This is a 36 page document and I'm gonna to go to the table of contents. This is a beginners. So this could be used for youth or for just basic advocacy um, type of information. So again, here's the, what is policy education? What is lobbying? Why advocate? Who should advocate? So th that's the kind of information that is gonna be in this toolkit that we have again on the website that you can download as a PDF. We also have some printed out and I will have some available um, at both events, at Substance Use Prevention Day and Suicide Prevention Day. We will have um, some of these, not one for everybody, but we'll have some of these available there as well. So you can download it or you can pick one up at um, one of our events coming up. Has anyone used that toolkit or is, is familiar with that toolkit? No. I've seen Nicole, it. Are, are there any comments in the in the chat? No. Okay. Um, I'm going to continue then. Tools. We um, have created tools that we have collected, and, and I, I want to give uh, uh, kudos to uh, AFSP, American Federation of Suicide Prevention, because some of these tools that we have, we actually were able to adopt from what they had created for their suicide uh, event two years ago, I, I think it was. And so we have some examples of these tools. I am going to actually bring those up as well. Let's see, here's the first one. How do I make this big? Okay, can you get everyone see that now? Can't see it. Okay. So, yes, okay. <laughs> so, this is our theme for this year for suicide, for substance abuse for pre prevention day. So, we, we also have this for suicide prevention day. And this is basically you put your picture here, and here's a space where you tell your story about why you decided to advocate for this event or for this issue. And that's something that, again, in building that relationship, it's a tool that you can use as one of the communications. Um, like Megan was saying, you know, how much is too much? Well, this is something you can do to uh, introduce yourself if you have not received maybe a call back from the, the original phone call that you, you, you made. This is a, a template on how to request uh, a meeting with your legislator. And um, Dr. Raduka gave us some really good examples or some good ideas of how to uh, address them. Um, so he helped us create this. And so this is available. Again, it has this logo on it, but you can easily take this cut and paste it and put your information on there um, or your logo. And again, we can use it for either event because we will also have it for Suicide Prevention Day. So that is the template for that. We also have a script. And I know that for some people, especially if you're starting, you're like, well, I'm not really sure how to even start. Well, people with experience have come up with the script. So it's as simple as this. Hello, my name is... Um, 
and who you're uh, addressing. I live or work in this community. Thank you so much for all you are doing. I'd like to share about substance abuse prevention in our communities, or I'd like to share about suicide prevention in our communities. And then did you know, have a few of those um, uh, data points to, to, to be able to share, not too much, but definitely have some of those data points. All of these documents that um, we are sharing are available on our website. We, have, we are updating it to this year's themes. So what you'll find there now are the ones with last year's theme, but you will, we will have the ones with this year's theme available very, very soon. Um, we also come up with infographics for each of the substances, for alcohol, tobacco, for all of the um, different uh, topics. We will have infographics and fact sheets that you can use for yourself, for your community, or that you can also provide for the legislator. So all these are the tools that we have available. Um, and the other thing that we have, of course, are our webinars. And in, in previous years, we have provided some, some webinars. Here's an example of one, ABCs of Advocacy. If you're interested in going back and getting more information on the basics of advocacy, um, we have these available on our website. Um, there's also a couple of webinars that are a little more advanced. Dr. David Jernigan has provided um, some webinars for us in the past. Uh, for those of you that are familiar with him, he is an expert um, in, in the field. And so if you're looking for something a little more with a little more information, that webinar is also on our website. All right, five easy steps. I'm, I have, uh, I, I'm not from this current generation, but I love the top five or the, the three easiest ways to do this. And so I thought it'd be good for us to talk about the five steps here, um, which is gonna kind of summarize everything that we've talked about. Identify whom you want to persuade. So who is your target audience? That's important to identify. So now I'm gonna open it up to the conversation based on everything that we've talked about today, how do I do that? How do I identify whom I want to persuade, who my target audience is? You can use the openstates.org website to find out who your representative is. Excellent, thank you, Nicole. Is there any, anything else I should do to find out or to identify my target audience? Well, it can be where you live and also where you work. So you got, you'll have multiple, you could have multiple um, folks you wanna to talk to. Okay. Uh, you know, your representatives, you're in the general assembly and also the senators, depending on what communities you are. Um, uh, working with and and you know it's always uh, powerful for you to be in the district but you know as long as you're you're actively involved in that area that's okay too excellent so that's how i'm going to identify my state legislators how do i identify my other target audience where do i go or how do i know who they are Open States also helped you with that too. Okay. Anybody else have any suggestions? I'll say again too, I know I said this before, but you know, finding, finding your champion, finding somebody who's interested, even if it's just peripherally, they don't have time to learn everything about everything. So even if someone seems like they're a well-informed person on the subject, it never hurts to share facts and data and, and shareable infographics and things like that. So I think seeking out a champion is always a good, um, a good part of the process. Excellent. Thank you, Megan. And also, obviously, our local elected officials, the people that um, the community stakeholders, those are the people also that we want to, um, that are part of our, of our target audience. Know your facts. 
how do we know our facts and what kind of facts do we need to know? Yeah, not done with that. Your local data um, and survey information and um, just statistics and things like that that are relate relate to the issue and are specific to their communities and their constituencies. Okay, so Harry, if, if you don't mind, give me one example of a specific data. You don't have to give me the percentage or anything, um, but you're in substance abuse prevention. What is a data point that you would want to know so that you can share that? Um, well, just the, um, the number of students in the local middle high school that um, who drink alcohol uh, and also uh, maybe binge drink and things like that, um, that they would be concerned about uh, uh, relating to maybe underage drinking uh, and drinking, drinking and driving, proms, graduation, things that, that they probably hear some information about, but you have some more specific uh, information about the trends, what's happening with that and um, what we're working on that. And if, if you're doing other things like marijuana um, use and things like that, it might be related to youth, um, they would probably be interested in those numbers locally, what's happening in their communities that they represent. So we would get that, you know, student health surveys or local surveys that we do, um, you know, kids count information that you might get from Family Connection that would be relatable to that. Um, and just, you know, put those kind of crunch those things together in a, in a concise way that makes sense to them would be a good way to go. Yes, yes. So and if and if you're in uh, suicide prevention, what key facts, what key pieces of information would be important for you to present to your target audience? Well, you could use um, loss numbers, loss of life numbers, but also attempts. So you could use uh, the OASIS data. But I also think it's important to showcase um, um, mental health uh, resources in the area, if you have a mapping asset of that or, or, or lack thereof. Um, and then also you could do student health survey data around um, su suicidal thoughts or, or, or mental health, those mental health questions. All that is very important and, and accessible data that in the community you can use and showcase specific to your community. I would say related to that too, um, making a comparison, sometimes having something to compare a number to is really important. So, um, you know, what, what are the rates in your area relative to other areas, relative to the state, relative yeah. to the nation? Um, sometimes it's kind of hard to conceptualize how big or small a problem is until you have something to look at side by side. Well, exactly. And also with that, also with that, that the RTIs, um, you know, this recent analysis that we did the proposals for the PIP, you know, the rating, the rank, rankings of the counties, uh, especially mm -hmm. if you're in a high needs county, um, showing that overall uh, score and how it falls within the whole state, how it compares, especially if you're in one of those counties that has a lot of, uh, yeah, the social indicator study and how it, um, um, how you rank and, and where you fall into that. Um, and that also, uh, I think it's good to, if you have stories to mix in with that, like, you know, some, something happened locally that was tragic, unfortunately, uh, that you can, um, you know, throw that in too, to, to have some more personal, you know, um, situation, um, for them to, to relate because it you know numbers and all is good but if, it, if it's like a family that they might know or situation they might have heard of and you put that in there that you know this is why we're working on this to uh, make sure this doesn't happen to any more youth or families in our communities you know that's helpful too to mix in I think uh, if you have something like that to go along with that absolutely 
and I um had something um something that came up when we did on a local suicide prevention um event the conversation about and I know it's a little morbid but what methods are they using what methods are higher um and it, it tends to be different like with the genders um and so if we're looking at how their success if, if they're um successful with their attempt then what method are they using and looking at ways to reduce access to those and something that came up was that the um, overdoses and um, firearms. So something that we offer the community through the um, um, John, John and Issa's um, uh, Arts Prescription Drug um, um, Project, the um, lockboxes, that was something that could dually reduce access to your medicines, um, arts prescriptions, and firearms. But that just came up in a conversation. Well, and I, I think you you break up you bring up a great point, and I don't know if this is the spot to make it, but oftentimes um, I try to view myself as a connector. So you you just were in the right place, Sequoia. You knew of the resource, you heard of the need, and made that connection. I think that um, advocating that uh, we not only work to uh, do the work of prevention that we're doing, but we also serve as to help in, in the community as connectors. And that also um, aids that elected official to know that, you know, okay, so they, they're a person, not only do they know about this, but they also have access or connections to get X, Y, and Z, because we do work generally with family connections or in a collaborative fa fashion in the community. Um, I think that also makes us um, very, um, a great uh, asset to the elected official and not only, and obviously to the community as well. I love that. I love what you guys are sharing. I, I, I'm, I wanna mention that a lot of what we've, we've been mentioning in terms of information are not just the specific issue, but the contributing factors, right? Um, for example, we talked, if, if, if you are looking at substance abuse um, prevention, hospitalizations, how many overdoses are there? I'm uh, talking to law enforcement in terms of what kind of data do they have? Um, especially now uh, with the increase of uh, alcohol delivery, right? There, there's, there's, there's places, I don't know if it's um, everywhere. In some places now it's more allowable to have that, um, to have alcohol delivered um, and how do they check the age? And so having those extra information, those contributing factor type of information um, would also help. It's not just how many kids drink alcohol, but what happens when young people drink alcohol? What happens when uh, there are these many suicide attempts or what happens when there is a lack of mental health services in the community? How does it affect? Um, so now we begin to communicate. We, we know our facts. And again, we don't know everything, right? It's okay not to know everything, um, but we begin to, to, to communicate and it's important to have, to know what your ask is. Now, some people will uh, say that your ask, okay, is not necessarily to vote a certain way. Okay, that's not what we were talking about here. We're not asking them to vote in a certain way. Um, but your ask could be, give me some examples. What is, what is your ask? What is it that you're beginning to communicate with this person? Um, what is the purpose, I guess I would say? I would say one aspect is asking them to share with their colleagues. Excellent. So you begin to communicate 
you begin to send emails, you begin to make phone calls, you begin to set up those um, virtual visits or in-person visits, then you begin to focus on, right? We're gonna limit the amount of facts. You're gonna, you're gonna focus on the few things that you want to make sure that, that you communicate, sorry. And then the fourth step here says advocate. Well, isn't all of this kind of part of, ad, uh, ad, um, of advocacy? This is the action part. This is a part where we're really talking about going out there and, and doing the action. And we talked about advocacy being the persuading, the, um, oh, what else did it say? Persuading, asking, pleading in, 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 in some cases. And last but not least, follow-up. It's all about the relationships. It's been said before uh, during this webinar, we have to build those relationships. We have to be the uh, key people that our elected officials that our legislators, that our community stakeholders come to when they need information about these issues. Esther, also, uh, yes. Esther, also about what, what the ask is too, is you're asking them to focus on, there's, there's, they're bombarded with so many issues and, and so many things, you're asking them to, to pay attention and focus on whether it's alcoholism, you know, alcohol, underage drinking, whether it's the other drugs, whether it's um, suicide prevention, whatever you're dealing with, you're asking them to pay attention to those issues uh, during the session and after the session and, and, and all, you know, and, and so that's what you ask is, you're just asking them, you know, pay attention to these, these concerns uh, this is why it's important and so forth and so on that, you know, and you're not asking like a specific, you know, legislation like you're saying, but you are asking them to pay attention and be concerned about it and, you know, be, be looking at these things and see if there's something they can do about it to make, you know, improve that condition. So, you know, that anyway, I'm sorry about that, but that's so I want to throw in. Oh, no, don't be sorry. That is excellent, Harry. Thank you so much for sharing that. Are there any other questions or suggestions? I want to share one thing. Is there someone else? It's John. It just the only thing that, that I've always found to be well, the, the, I guess the main thing I've always found to be my savior is uh, as fast as I can ask them what do they need. Mm. Uh, so I, you know, I I, I learned this many many years ago that when I get nervous, uh, which is very common, obviously in these scenarios is that uh, human beings, including myself, have a tendency to get um, what I call diarrhea of the mouth. And that, you know, just, I just, blah, 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 blah. I mean, just, you know, and so, so to keep myself from doing that, I know that was kind of a graphic uh, um, description, but I think it makes the point that, uh, that I've just, I've really engaged myself in question asking. And I, uh, I think that when I've had people that have been with me when I've been doing, because I've been doing advocacy work at the Capitol for 25 years or so. I did this with Family Connection Partnership when I worked for Family Connection. Um, you know, went up there and had Family Connection Day. And that's really where I learned how to do this and from the best. And that was just, main, I, I maintain a posture, a posture of questions to, the, to as much as I can without sounding like I'm interrogating them. Um, but when I do that, I get them talking and oftentimes um, they'll say a whole lot more. Well, they will say a whole lot more by you asking them questions uh, uh, and you'll be, they'll be more engaged than you telling them any number of things. So I guess my point here is simple and that is uh, maintain a posture of questions. Any other questions or suggestions? About to finish up here. Okay, I to, yes. That's the one thing. Um, the thing is, you remember, they represent you. They are working for you. You know, sometimes yes. I think we get intimidated because of their position and their, you know, we think they have power and everything, and they do. But I think we have to remember that, you know, they they're they work for us, um, and they're and most of them are pretty good people that want to do good. So sometimes they just need to be um, given encouragement to look and, and to consider the right things because there's a bunch of lobbyists 
who have a lot of money and resources that are going to push them other directions. And so, you know, we have to just gently, you know, get their attention. And so don't be intimidated. I know it's hard. I mean, I get intimidated too, but um, try to just remember, you know, they're there to represent us and our interests. And if we don't tell them our interests and our concerns, they won't know. So, you know, go with confidence and go with boldness and, and go with humility as well. So uh, that's my two cents worth for the day. Thank you so much for sharing that. I'm gonna wait a second to see if anybody else has something to share. I have one more resource I wanted to share but I'm gonna wait and see if anybody has any suggestions. I mean, the amount of experience that is on this call um, is amazing. So those of you, especially that have had the experience, please feel free to share your, uh, your suggestions. Those of you that maybe are starting brand new and have maybe never had a visit uh, with your legislator, please feel free to ask questions. And I want to check one more time to see if there's anything in the chat. I'm not checking the chat. So if Nicole or Gabby can check and see if there's anything that we need to respond to there. No questions to respond to. Okay, perfect. perfect. Oh, I'm sorry. Megan did put up a, a nice little um, thought to keep in mind. She says, you catch more bees with honey. Yeah. Yes, that is so true. I love that saying. Okay, so in terms of educating ourselves, well, in my uh, attempt to educate myself more um, and learn, I found out that there's this uh, prevention institute and we were talking to them about doing an advocacy training that they will be doing for us in the near future. But something that I learned from them is the spectrum of prevention. Now, this reminded me of something. So I'm gonna ask those that are, uh, certified prevention people and have gone through SAPS training, what does this remind you of? Or what does this look like? Prevention specialist? SPF. Uh, I'm yeah. here, but I, yeah, I'm looking at uh, just reading it over. So yeah, I, I take some time, so. If you have a DFC or have a role for a, a DFC grant, you know that they require um, us to follow certain steps. There are seven of them or levels of um, engagement. Level yeah. Yes. Trying Shannon, start. you want to share what, what, what this looks like? So um, there's a, 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 I mean, not to use this word, but duplicate the word, but there's a spectrum of change, community level change strategies that start off um, basically like this, uh, increased knowledge base, and then goes all the way up to, um, well, this is into educating policymaker, but policy change being the highest level, the hardest sometimes level of change, but the highest level of change that is the most effective as a sustainable change. So this follows that spectrum very easily. It kind of mimics it in a way. Yes, it does. So when I saw this, I thought, well, this is pretty interesting. It, 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 it relates to something that I'm already familiar with. Um, and they actually, I think the, it's from um, CSAP, the seven strategies. Sure. And they start off with information dissemination. Right. Right. Which is the very basic. You go to a health, uh, a health fair and you're in the community and you're passing out information all the way to educating policymakers. Um, and I love the way they put it, the example of developing strategies to inform policies. Um, this prevention and intervention um, website, if, if you're interested in studying some more, we will be having a webinar with them um, in the future, but they have recorded modules of this, of their whole uh, program. On, on their website, this is one of their modules, the spectrum of prevention. And I have really enjoyed um, listening to those. So for those of you that want a little bit more, that are interested in, in going a step beyond um, some of the basics in advocacy, um, I invite you to look at Prevention Institute and the spectrum of prevention. So having said that, 
Are there any more comments, questions? I want to remind everybody that Substance Abuse Prevention Advocacy Day will be February 24th and that Suicide Prevention Day will be March 30th. We have the registrations links in the chat box. If you're not a member, please sign up. That is the best way for you to receive the emails for all the different things that we do, whether they're phone calls, whether they're networking things or webinars, activities, that's the best way to stay in, uh, informed of everything. And I think if that is all, thank you all for being here. Thank you for sharing um, your experience. Thank you for your questions. And I look forward to seeing all of you either virtually or in person <laughs> at our event. Thank you, Events. Esther. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Megan. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone.